do you do? Okay. You don't need to. going first, right? Correct. So he wants to speak into the microphone. I can't stand up. Oh. You could, you could take it off here if you walk around with it. Well. Will the aldermen please take their seats so we can get this meeting started? Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2019-2020 Board of Aldermen Budget Deliberations. Today is April 24th, 2019, and today we are here for the departmental presentation portion of the automatic budget process. But before we begin, will everyone please join me as we salute our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Madam Secretary, will you please take the roll? Alderman Anderson. Alderman Anderson would like to be excused, Madam Secretary. Alderman Beatty. Present. Alderman Fortunati. Here. Alderman Gaynor. Here. Alderman German. Madam Secretary, Alderman German would like to be excused. Alderman Genentasio. Here. Alderman Golden. Here. Alderman Grant. Madam Secretary, Alderman Grant would also like to be excused. Thank you. Alderman Hardiman. <coughs> Alderman Hardiman would also like to be excused, Madam Secretary. Alderman Smith. Smith, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alderman Sutton. Alderman Sutton would also like to be excused, Madam Secretary. Alderman Tranquilli. Here. Alderman Vecarelli. Here. Alderman Vitro. Here. Alderman Vitali. Here. Ten present. 
We have 10 present, we do have a quorum. At this, I'd like to entertain a motion to come out of recess. So moved. Second. A motion has been made and seconded to come out of recess. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're out of recess. At this point, the first department organization on our agenda is education operations. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are ready. So good evening, thank you very much uh, for having us here this evening and for the opportunity to share our Board of Education proposed budget for the year 2019-2020. Uh, I can't believe we're talking about the year 2020. <laughs> um, after some opening remarks, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Kutaya, who will share more details with you, and then when she's done, we can answer your questions, if that's okay. Uh, the board's funding request uh, reflects a 1.89% increase over the current budget. It represents our desire to support the continuing growth of our school system and to honor our long-standing vision statement that Milford Public Schools will be a progressive school district in which students are prepared to achieve at their highest level, surrounded by an engaged community that is proud of its education system. As the board worked toward the process of selecting a new superintendent, we relied on a leadership profile that was developed with input from our students, staff, members, parents, and the broader community. The results told us that people were ready to see Milford Public Schools rise to the next level, and that is our focus. As I stated in my budget letter, times continue to change and the world of education is evolving to keep pace. Young people today learn very differently than the way we did, or even the way my own children did, and it is important that we acknowledge that. Milford Public Schools is ready to join the evolution, and we feel this budget begins to move us in that direction. School districts across the state continue to be challenged by rising costs for contractual obligations, and Milford is no different. But we continue to develop our budgets with great sensitivity to taxpayers, seeking savings that will offset these increases and allow us to include some modest investments that we feel address our current needs. Dr. Kutaya and her team will address the specific funding requests and the reductions found in this budget, but before I close, I want to reiterate, it is always our desire to provide for student learning that is engaging and relevant to today's times and to support our exceptional staff with appropriate professional development opportunities in a positive working environment in order to foster the district's growth and continual improvement. Milford is a community which values investment in our schools, and a strong school system benefits the entire citizenry. We appreciate the support we have had from Mayor Blake, from yourselves, and from other city leaders, and it is my hope that you share our commitment to place a high value on education, and I hope you will recognize the board's pledge to bring before you a budget that truly addresses the needs of our children. Thank you. Dr. Kutaya. Thank you, Ms. Glennon. And thank you to this board for allowing me for uh, the first time as the superintendent of the schools of Milford uh, to present to you what I believe is a numerical representation of our next level of work in Milford Public Schools. I believe before you uh, is a budget that balances being fiscally responsible along with dreaming big for our students, for our young people in Milford and providing uh, improvements and growth in the areas of teaching and learning. It is with great intention that this PowerPoint presentation is entitled Teaching and Learning because the focus of our budget is to continue to improve what's happening in each and every one of our classrooms to support the staff uh, that we are able to recruit and develop and retain and to also continue to grow each individual child. So I hope you will find uh, throughout this presentation some highlights uh, that will continue to bring us to next level of work. So I have a, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation before you, so whether you follow along on paper or on screen or just listen, uh, I'd like to provide some, um, just some uh, highlights of what is included in this budget, and then of course we'll uh, happily entertain any specific questions you may have. So back in October, the Board of Education and I uh, dialogue around what are the budget priorities. And uh, one way to look at priorities um, at the Board of Education budget is to sort of understand that these are those things that we will hold sacred. That these are the things that as we go through the process, we will try to uh, prioritize uh, and keep whole. 
And while I will not read each one of these bullets to you, please note that some of uh, these um, bullets include safety and security, uh, instructional programming, class size, the development of our adults, um, the district's extended learning throughout the summer, and the district's extended learning into extracurricular and after-school programming. A second dialogue that the Board of Education and our uh, leadership team have includes our budget assumptions. Another way to understand this is to, uh, it's a projection, a forecasting of what are those influences out there uh, on our uh, budget walking into the 1920 school year. While I won't read all these bullets to you, some of these include enrollment, decisions about staffing and programming, salary, anticipation of salary increases, health insurance, uh, costs, rising costs of special education, transportation costs, those costs in our utilities, um, again, the SRO program, growing that program, the ongoing efforts to reduce um, the number of times teachers are outside of classrooms, and then, of course, finding any efficiency possible to offset any increases. These are priorities and assumptions that are dialogued with the Board of Ed Education and were formally voted and approved by the Board back in October of 2018. Now, while I would like to take up a lot of your time this evening celebrating the great accomplishments of our young people and our staff in Milford Public Schools, I realize we don't have a lot of time. So I, um, in our original Board of Education presentation, if you're interested, it is available on our website. There are numerous slides that I uh, edited out of this presentation that celebrates and highlights what our young people are doing. So the investment in our schools, for lack of better terms, because we're not technically a business, is, is yielding a return on investment. And the return on investment is through what our young people are able to do. The number of accomplishments, uh, awards, uh, the way they uh, go out and um, function and volunteer in this community and in communities around us uh, are all celebrated and highlighted in a presentation that you can see on the website. But I decided to leave two uh, slides here just to highlight, just to, to show that what we are putting in our schools is being returned to us through what our young people can do. And one thing I have found in my first 10 months of Mil in Milford is that our young people, while they may go, uh, leave at the end of 12th grade, many, many, many people come back and reinvest in our community. And that, I think, is the long-term impact of what this whole community invests in young people in, in, the, um, in the greater community, but also in our school community. So here's just the highlight of our advanced placement performance. Advanced placement uh, is an opportunity for young people in high school to do college level work and get credit for it. This is a statistic that we keep an eye on in the school system. And this is a number that has doubled over the past five years. Now, while we realize that 79.9%, I believe, uh, about that, of our budget is taken up in salaries and benefits. Please know it's through those people, those teachers, those people we hire, that we're able to offer these options, these AP courses, additional electives, so young people could perform to this level. And we have four national AP scholars averaging a score four or better. These statistics on advanced placement are pretty phenomenal. I'd also like to uh, highlight for you that our students are um, ex, uh, applying and being accepted into top tier colleges and universities. And these are just a handful of those universities, are highly competitive universities that are young people because of the experiences they're having in Milford Public Schools, because of what this budget supports, are able to do out in the world. So let's get to some of the numbers. This proposed um, and Board of Ed approved budget totals $95,078,487, which is a 1.89% increase over last year, this year's budget. So what does that get, get us? Outside of almost 80% invested in salaries and benefits, there are some systemic improvements that I'd like to highlight. I'd like to bring to your attention that this year we have started a one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative, and we plan to continue that. This year we will have a, a Chromebook in the hands of every 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth grader. Next year, we hope to expand that to grades 3 through 12. 
That is no small task, uh, but it pays great dividends. Uh, students are able to access many, many learning resources. Um, and really, it's a way of learning today for our young people that even maybe some people in this room may be less comfortable with. This is just a natural extension of their learning. We're also going to invest in a new classroom interactive board that connects to the Chromebook so that all students can be sharing their learning. So the interactive whiteboard that you may be familiar with, well, there's a new version of that. So as we age out and as we um, go into continue our replacement uh, cycle, we'll be moving to a different interactive whiteboard that is Chromebook friendly, so that everyone in the room becomes part of the teaching learning process, including the young people in the room. And finally, in the area of technology, we will be um, upgrading our robotics equipment uh, you know, the field, the STEM field is a highly sought out career field. We believe we should prepare our students or pique their interest uh, in, while they're in school before they get out into college to experiment with this field uh, in, in, uh, of work. So we are upgrading the robotics equipment for all of our high school courses. Additional systemic improvements, I'm happy, happy to share that we are finally starting a world language program in grades kindergarten and first. This is something that I heard uh, very loudly from our listen and, my Listen and Learn tour the first six months as I was talking with parents and other members of our community that they believe we need the world language opportunity in the elementary schools. Uh, right now, um, we have it uh, starting in sixth grade. That's an expansion that occurred this year and we are going to imagine K-1 for next year, K-3 the following year, and hopefully K-5 in two years from now. So in two to three years, we will have a full K-12 world language opportunity for all Milford uh, students. We also, um, I'm so thankful that um, we were introduced to ACE My Interview by um, a Milfordite, uh, Mike Croak. I want to say croaky, but that always messes me up. So uh, Mike came into our world and introduced this opportunity. And actually, I um, observed a uh, Ace My interview with Mr. Fran Thompson, who was the interviewee, uh, who experimented with that this year, this week. Um, and actually, he did quite well. We're going to let him keep the job at law. Um, so um, we've, we are finding, uh, so far, great experience with this Ace My interview. Our young people are raving about it. They believe it's a real world experience. And so we're gonna provide this for all juniors starting next year through this budget. We've also heard from our middle schoolers that they want after school opportunities to be active and still have options in sports and not try to get them uh, filtered into JV and varsity sports so young. So we're gonna provide sports clinics to keep our young middle schoolers active after school. And that is open to all students. You don't have to qualify or make the team. And then uh, we are expanding uh, under the safety and security umbrella, expanding our SRO program to include one at the academy. And finally, in the area of systemic improvement, um, research has come a long way in the area of physical space and how it impacts learning. So we're moving toward a flexible cl a furniture classroom for uh, all of our students eventually in all of our classrooms, but we're starting with the middle school. Uh, we have some nice, um, uh, workups of what those classrooms will look like. This budget includes uh, some pilot classrooms for all three middle schools. Uh, we also are going to continue to improve our fitness rooms, but also include one at Harborside. It's the only middle school that does not have a fitness room. And um, just to look outward, there are so many projects in 14 buildings that require investments um, that just cost too much to do all in one year. So we are building uh, intentionally, we're expanding the multi-year replacement and development. Um, so we, a couple of those examples would include like interactive whiteboards, uh, replacement of cubbies at our elementary schools. Um, we have other examples to share with you if you need. But that multi-year perspective on how to budget and plan is built into this budget. So it's not always add, add, add in a budget. I start with our leadership team saying a budget development budget. Budget development is not always a, uh, an activity of addition. It is also an activity of subtraction. And you will see here what our savings include. Our savings include the reduction of staff according to enrollment and or need, substitute teachers reducing that line item uh, for a second or third year in a row, 
uh, replacing our data portal to become more efficient and user friendly. And then there are some savings in the property, liability, and telecommunications lines. That savings um, is also included in a two-pager. Do they have the two-pager yet? Yep. Yes. So more detailed uh, is in front of you on the two-pager that Mr. Richitelli handed out to you, as well as this repre visual representation of where budget requests have been for the last 12 years. And here's a pie chart demonstrating the percentage of our um, percentages by category of the budget. Again, almost 80% is included is caught up in salaries and benefits. And then there's a breakdown in other categories. This is a nice visual. It shows you uh, a breakdown of what the 1.89% looks like by category. So you will see of the 1.7 million, about 900,000, the increase uh, is in salary. So that concludes my presentation to you as an overview of what the system improvements are, inc are included in the 1.89% increase over this year. And I am thankful for your consideration of this budget and happy to answer any questions you may have. Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Kataya, and good evening, Board Chair uh, Glennon, and the rest of the representatives here tonight. Just before I get into the weeds, just want two questions. When you talked about the Chromebooks from six to eight, is that going to be ownership on those kids? Are they are they are they theirs to keep quote keep for the three years? Could you explain that, please? Sure, I can. Uh, so uh, they are the property of the school district, but they are assigned to an individual student, and we anticipate the student to have them for a four or five year period, at which time then there will be a replacement cycle. But they are property of Milford Public Schools. That's, I, I kind of assumed that, but what happens, what's the, where is the responsibility of something, where is responsibility within that four years for that individual towards those Chromebooks, as far as they losing them or breaking them, are we still going to take that responsibility? Are they going to be able to say, look, prorate it, you owe us, whatever? Uh, so good question. We bought uh, Gorilla Strength Chromebooks, just for the record. Um, and I, uh, Chromebooks are being developed for young people, so um, they know um, the type of technology and uh, material that needs to be used to, uh, for young people. But, of course, accidents and repair will be needed. So we have in-house capability to do most of our repairs. Uh, parents do engage in a contract with us. There is an, um, a, a user um, acceptable use policy that they sign off on, and that includes uh, the cost of replacement and repairs beyond what we will be able to handle. There will be some responsibility on the, on the student and the, and the uh, parent. There will the be, family. yes. Thank you. The other thing is uh, I see that there are 102 students were deemed AP scholars. I can't rem I, correct me if I'm wrong, about a few years ago, a lot of the top tier colleges were coming out with statements indicating the fact that there were a lot of kids getting into AP courses. And the sum product of the end there was that they weren't really enamored by the AP courses that kids were coming in with. Is that, did anybody hear about that? Or am I just looking at something, but I did hear that. Any, any? No, actually, I serve on the regional board of the college board, uh, and the uh, mentality of the college board is to open up access to more students, while at the same time supporting students to score uh, at a passing grade. So it's not just, in a, a school district's perspective on AP, is not just increasing the number of students that can take the class, but who can successfully score well on the course test. So the AP scholars is anyone who could score three or higher. So of course, that would be our goal to open up access, which Milford Public Schools has done many years ago. Uh, and we've been uh, actually recognized where these, um, I hope I have the statistic correct. Uh, we are the second highest school district in the state of Connecticut with the number of students taking AP courses. Um, and we're recognized for that. So um, I think Milford has done a nice job in balancing access with success. 
Very good, thank you. I'll relinquish the mic at this point. Thank you. Alderman Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Dr. Katay and our educational leaders. Um, I am a, um, a proud product of the Milford Public School System, although I wouldn't rush to brag about it or put it in any brochure that you put out. But, but I do, in fact, I just had lunch with my sixth grade teacher who I haven't seen in almost 50 years. And um, he, along with Alderman Vitale, go way back in the Milford Public School System and a lot of common experiences. It, when, just to enlighten me a little bit about the practical day-to-day -day of, of the schools, and we did take a tour. Um, I know some of us did. I know you did um, um, earlier la or last uh, fall at uh, West Shore Middle School and yep. several others, which was a very uh, enlightening. But of course, it wasn't an active school day. When we have Chromebooks and some of these new technical advancements that didn't exist when I attended Milford Public Schools, how much of that actually offsets traditional learning materials like textbooks? I mean, is, there, is that fair to say that Chromebooks take the place in many cases of schlepping around with a lot of textbooks and the expense of replacing those? And I mean, how does that work out in terms of not just finances, but practically for the average student. Is that where most of their material now is, where their homework is assigned, that sort of thing? You know, um, I don't think we'll ever get to the day where we'll, we won't have any books in classrooms. So let me just start off by saying that. So no, no one needs to fear that we're gonna obliterate books out of schools. I think we will move more toward um, uh, resources that are accessible online for young people but I, I, there may be just a better balance where there will still be uh, a physical text to use as well as online resources. So uh, we will use, um, investigate through the curriculum writing process um, what, open source doc, um, what open sources there are out there and that's becoming a much more popular thing in the uh, field of public education. Uh, so that would be free, so that would help offset costs in a, in a budget. Um, and we'll be also looking at what other resources we would need to implement curriculum. So some will be online, accessible via the internet, uh, through a Chromebook or whatever device. But I don't think we'll ever move away completely from a uh, concrete text. There are some, like there are some AP courses that require the purchase of a textbook. They won't let you run the course without the, the textbook. So you have some of those, um, those guidelines in place that you won't be able to get around unless College Board changes that. Alderman Gaynor. Good evening. My question is surrounds the um, Chromebooks. So in uh, today's day and age with bullying, both in person and cyber, what safeguards are in place to prevent that? And what mechanisms will then be enacted if there is a breach? Um, thanks for that question. Uh, Milford Public Schools has always had, um, even before we went to one-to-one, -to -one, a filtering and monitoring system. Um, so what we just recently did is we, um, we entered into a new contract with a different company, so we upgraded uh, because of this initiative. Uh, we believe this company has uh, better filtering and monitoring programming, but the feature that we especially like is uh, parents can um, sign up to receive notifications uh, based on a student's activity on certain categories, such as bullying, as you mentioned. Uh, and they can actually receive uh, push notifications if something is happening. So we've expanded it from um, the school system uh, having the opportunity to filter and monitor so that parents can engage in that process too because we know that students are not just learning between school hours. There's a lot happening and if you've met a teenager recently, they're usually up much later than any of us. <laughs> and so some of that activity may be occurring beyond hours that we would even uh, wouldn't be awake for. That allows parents to monitor from their, their own device. A follow, -up, oh, a follow up, I'm sorry. So would that also include like a Chrome instant messaging? It's not necessarily a social website. And also I see that the books will be allowed to go home. What kind of jurisdiction then 
will you have to monitor that once the books are home? So um, it is a monitoring 24-7 um, situation. But we also have, um, for lack of better terms, uh, a lockdown on certain sites. And as long as they're using their Chromebook and they're logged in um, under our milforded.org login, which is the only way you could use the Chromebook, you are being monitored. You can't use your Yahoo account or whatever. So it is a 24-7. We're just not watching it on a Saturday night at midnight. Um, it's being watched by the company. The information is there for us to access if we need it, but mom and dad have the ability to watch it if they want to on a Saturday night at midnight. Alderman, Alderman Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, through you to each of the board. Thank you. Um, it's an opportunity for us to get to, uh, to speak to each of you and to thank you for what you do for the children of Milford, including our uh, volunteer, Ms. Glennon, as the Board of Ed Chair. I have a question about uh, the reduction in pullout time is one of your budget priorities, reduction in pullout time of teachers from the classroom with a consequent reduction in substitute teaching payroll. But you also started with ongoing education and professional development for teachers as being critical as you move into more technology. So how do you balance that? And is there more, I um, guess I'd like to see a more uh, specific budget for training and professional development and things like you do as uh, on the board of uh, uh, the college board, you know, do the, the teachers have an opportunity to be involved in organizations of their profession? Uh, thanks for that question, Alderman Beattie. Um, this is something, uh, as a new superintendent, that I'm taking a close look at. Uh, so um, these priorities in this budget was created the three months on the job. Um, so uh, some of these uh, have been a carryover. And uh, Dr. Fedigan, our new assistant superintendent, and I um, are actually uh, stepping back and taking a look at the full curriculum writing process, the instructional model, the assessment program and the professional learning that supports all three of those. And those, by the way, are the three That's core key. areas of our business in, in education. You know, curriculum, instruction, assessment. So while uh, we know that the most important resource we could provide to a child is the teacher, and the quality of the teacher, and the continuous development of the teacher, we know the more we pull a teacher out, the less, uh, less that's not, so very, not very good for kids, right? So we are going to revisit the balance of that. And yes, teachers have opportunities to um, join and attend uh, professional organizations, conferences, meetings. That happens um, all the time in Milford. Um, we encourage that. We want uh, teachers to stay plugged in and involved in professional organizations. Um, but we have a challenge. Um, the less you pull a teacher out throughout the year, the less likely you are supporting the continuity of implementation of right. programming because if you take it on a volunteer basis or even a pay basis in the summer, you can't guarantee that you have your entire science department present, let's say, on July 7th when you're holding the PD. Right. So um, while this is a budget uh, priority, uh, I believe we'll be revisiting that notion and that approach in the upcoming years. The more we write curriculum and the more we focus on improved instructional practice. While we can't swing to the other side again and just pull everybody out. There's going to just have to be a better balance. Okay, thank you. That's a good answer. So it's really ongoing efforts to reduce the number of times in tandem with the professional development uh, piece to, be, to find a balance rather than just yes, the goal of reducing the substitute teacher funds. They're related. Well, thank you. And then the second question I have is about the SRO pro uh, program. We all know that it's funded uh, in a formula with the uh, uh, police department and with uh, the Department of Education. Uh, but to me, the funding, the, the future funding or ongoing sustainability should be dependent on a systematic evaluation. And we heard a lot. We had a very good presentation from the police department with anecdotal material that the parents, the teachers, the administration, and the general public are satisfied with the SRO program and wanted to uh, continue. So that was nice to hear. But it should be evaluated nationally by the standards 
of the SRO. And you know that it is controversial uh, because it stems from law enforcement. And there are standards with outcomes. And um, when I asked about uh, the police department about it, uh, they concurred, but it wouldn't seem to be that it would be their responsibility to do that evaluation. So is that your responsibility or is that something that needs? I see that it's a, it's a point of you know, good discussion. Um, does it need more resources or uh, a different look or? Uh, so I'll start off by um, just uh, correcting myself. I believe during the presentation I said that we're adding an SRO to the academy. We're adding a security guard to the academy. So right. I just want to go on the record to correct myself. Sorry about that. Um, I know that um, our... It uh, says security in the written material. Right, but I think but I spoke said, SRO. Right. I'm sorry. Um, our um, director of safety and security uh, engages in an evaluation of all 14 of our campuses on a regular basis and does that with law enforcement. So from the safety and security perspective, we know where um, our needs are on the campuses, the physical campuses, and therefore each year we put in improvements to continue to make them safer and the safer. The actual assessment of the effectiveness of the SRO program, I will have to say, is mostly anecdotal at this right. point. Um, I, I don't know how to quantify that unless we have a crisis, <clears throat> I guess. Um, I and I wonder if- I wasn't questioning yeah. in the safety, and it's, it's wonderful as a parent or grandparent, but I was just thinking that there must be national standards to, to measure them and a model for that, and other uh, bigger cities are- yeah. Uh, engaged in trying to uh, look at the outcomes in relation to the, the stated objectives. And that's what I think is missing. I think I'll take that back um, and talk to the team about it. That's a really interesting um, point, I think, worth uh, looking into. And so then we can you. support it, you know, more fully. And then lastly, um, one time in another discussion, uh, we always have the opportunity to hear what's going on with Department of Education, that's very good. And Ms. Glennon mentioned something about, she used the term like schools. Is that the same as our benchmark schools? And I'm thinking of, you know, with standardized testing for all the pitfalls about that, who are our benchmark towns and schools? So I can. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Who are what? Our benchmark school districts to compare who Milford. Who do so I know that Connecticut yeah. uh, engaged in a process that they've, they no longer continue, but it's still used widespread throughout the state of our um, district regional groups, the DERGs, Dirks. and Milford is a DERG D, and it ranges from A through I, I being the mo more, most affluent school districts in the state of Connecticut, and I being um, the greatest of, um, uh, of poverty. So from an educator's perspective, we usually take a look at the DERG D schools to see how we do in comparison to those school districts. I do know that it's been practice in Milford to also take a look at school districts such as Wallingford, Shelton, Southington, and New Milford. Uh, I'm not sure what DERGs all those are, um, but that has been a, a standing practice here in Milford. If I could add, um, you know, we're not certain that those, that that comparison is still relevant. That is something that um, we need to look at some more because we've been, those, those four schools have been kind of our COPE benchmark for a, a number of years, going back probably 10 years now. So um, maybe that needs a mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kataya, I just wanted to, um, I, know, I know the subject usually comes up or always comes up on this board about um, the declining enrollment in our school system. Um, I know the Board of Education works on that, but I just wanted to see what your thoughts are on that. With the, uh, with the declining enrollment, do you, do you foresee in the future closing a school or two, or what's your feeling on that? So um, I believe our school system can be responsive to declining enrollment by revisiting the number of classroom teachers we assign uh, based on classroom size guidelines that have been established by the board. I think that's the most responsive we can be. Uh, if I understand our history correctly, we've experienced some closing, shuffling, reshuffling. 
amongst our schools. I heard very um, clearly from the stakeholders that I uh, spoke with over the last 10 months that they're not interested in that because of how it has divided a school community um, and how they feel like finally things are just settling in that area. And I, I will have to be honest, um, it's probably a dialogue we need to have um, with the board, but as soon as we start talking about closing schools, I started this presentation off by saying we are focusing on the improvement of teaching and learning. And while we are in a good place, there's a better place where Milford Public Schools can be. And we're dreaming that right now for our young people. There are improvements in technology and programming and curriculum and opportunities that as a leadership team we'd like to focus on. Uh, but as soon as we start talking about the closing of schools and redistricting, I, I'm a fearful that the educational leaders of the school system will be completely distracted and consumed with that. Um, and I'm fearful that our school community will feel divided once again and will take on that battle as opposed to the battle of what other opportunities can we provide our students to stretch and grow their thinking and learning? Do we need more enrichment? Do we need more before and after school opportunity? Do we need to extend it to the summer more? Do we need to include more thinking on our preschool experiences? I'd like for that to be our focus as a school system right now. So I, the response as the educational leader of Milford Public Schools to a declining enrollment right now, my preference would be to consider the FTEs that we um, allocate to classes but, and by also, uh, but also protecting the class size guidelines. So that will be my response at this time, at the stage of our work as a team. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Thank you. Alderman Tranquilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I could be a little off on the numbers, but was there roughly $1.2 million left over from the 2018 school budget if so, was the, what was the money used for? And could it have been used to offset the 1.89% increase this year? Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, through you to Alderman Tranquilly. Um, your number is essentially correct. Um, but I would, I would say to you that there's many factors that go into. Um, first and foremost, um, as you know, uh, boards of education cannot carry monies over. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, when we put budgets together, we're putting them together, as the city does, about, 18, in some cases, 18 months before the end of that budget year. So when we put budgets together, we, we project them based upon the best information that we have uh, and the numbers that we have, in some cases, 18 months before. Um, we budget for um, all of the staff that we know that we're going to need. We budget for all of the physical needs of the school system and we budget for uh, all of the instructional uh, supplies that we need for the school system. Um, the, the bulk of the, um, and, and we'll call it surplus, but it's really not surplus. Um, the bulk of it is, comes in the wage area. Um, and we budget in the wage area for a certain number, we, we, number, we budget for exactly the number of teachers that we have and the number of support staff that we have. Um, and so that's an exact number. Then we factor in, we know that there's going to be a, a turnover savings, that there's going to be um, some retirements that year, and people are gonna come in at uh, lower wages than the person that retired. And we, we base that upon an average. We, we have 18 retirements on average per year. Um, in some budget years, which, is, which was the case last year, we only had 13 uh, teachers retire, which accounts for a good portion of the surplus in the wage accounts. Um, what we've, we've adjusted for that in this budget, we're, we're only, um, we, I say only, but we're, we've reduced that to um, 15. We're budgeting for 15. So we're kind of taking into account um, that there was, there was less last year. This year in that retirement account, in the current 19-20 uh, budget, or I'm sorry, 18-19 budget, uh, we already have 19 teacher retirements. So we know that we're gonna have a shortfall in that account. So um, what I would say to you is that 
we have to we have to budget for what we believe it's going to cost and then in some years it's going to be less some years it's going to be more you asked what that surplus goes to and it's been the practice of the Board of Education and it's it's been a practice of the city to recognize that if there's savings at the end of the year it goes back into our mostly our physical plan when we budget for buildings and grounds projects which is keeping up with our with our schools which are aging but are is are in excellent shape we budget for a number that only addresses probably the first or second priorities at each school that only touches the surface but if there is money left over at the end of the year it goes right back into those physical plants so we can go a little bit deeper into the priorities of each school and that's how we the board has been able to keep up with the schools keep them in excellent shape clean and 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 safe for our students so I hope that answer your question if I can mr. chairman just follow up so is it safe to say that most of that money probably went to building repairs so in turn would probably put you in better shape this year for some of the repairs that you wanted to do yes they it all went into with the vast majority of it went into buildings and grounds and but but let me tell you that the the priority list is long and so it it we only scratch the surface every year we're not we're and there's nothing on that list of buildings and grounds projects that's in any way shape or form extravagant or a frill it's general maintenance of the buildings it's replacement of cubbies in the classrooms lockers at the high school painting the walls it's essentials that we can't do without if we if if we were really if if there were not going to be some recognition of any additional money going back into our buildings then we would have to budget for much more in those buildings and grounds lines up line items and just one more question if I can in previous years was there any particular reason why some money was given back to the city in in other years not it depends on the particular in the particular year I think in the don't quote me on the year I believe it was the 15 16 school year there were drastic mid-year cuts from the state of Connecticut and the mayor the mayor asked all city departments in including the Board of Education to cut back as much as possible the Board of Education did that we the superintendent at the time put some measures into place and we were able to recognize some savings at the end of the year that the board designated to go back to the city to help with the drastic cuts that the state was imposing upon the city at that time thank you Alderman Beatty thank you through youth chapters yes I think I'd like to boast about something that you don't have in your report that I think that the Milford school system does very well but should be noted and that's the number of students who attend post-secondary education a large percentage and I think what happens is we focus on this the many students who go to private school but the vast majority of students from Milford do not wind up in Brandeis and NYU and Duke and etc but really do very well and not only in the four-year institutions but in the all the public institutions and it's really upward mobility for for many of our students and you do that very well and it would be I bet the percentage is very high and Milford still is a first-generation college student town yes until it shifts maybe in ten more years and so I also think that our students in Milford are a feeder school are a feeder district for the community colleges 
in the state and um, really do very well, and the community colleges do very well uh, by them. So someplace, so it's a compliment and an admonition to include that in the report, because uh, that's a primary responsibility that you enact very well. But we, and I don't want us to lose sight of that with all the trouble that we have at the state level in the funding of education, because our, our students are served by those institutions. So thanks, Thank and congratulations on that. Do you know the percentage of students who, who attend post-secondary education? Uh, not necessarily a, a four-year baccalaureate program. In the 90s, 90 in the percentile, 90s. I bet, yeah. yeah. So I, maybe that could be in the report. Alderman Gaynor. Uh, hello. So any of the extra, we'll call it extra money that was went back into the facilities. I know last year, Sue, you had talked about there was a wish list of um, items that weren't necessarily in the budget that you had hoped for. And I believe the board authorized an, an additional $80,000. Some of that was uh, air conditioning for the classrooms. And if I'm not mistaken, the beginning of the school year, there was a lot of um, a days or several days that kids were sent home because of the extreme heat. Was any of the additional money utilized to, for any of that air conditioning? I, I, I believe that there, there was one project, um, I believe that it was at Orange Avenue School, um, where additional air conditioning was, um, was put in. The board has to realize that uh, the, I would, I, would, I would go to say about 70% of our schools are not air conditioned. And, and the cost of air conditioning in the entire school district is astronomical. Not only the installation, but, um, but the annual cost of uh, increased, um, the, the, the increased electricity. West Shore Middle School, when we, when we put the addition on, about a third, the, the electric bill went up by about a third because we're air conditioning the media center and uh, the gymnasium. So there's a tremendous cost, and we understand that um, it's, it's very hot um, at the beginning of the year and it's very hot at the end of the year. Um, some years we luck out and, and it doesn't get that hot. Um, students, students who have special needs, um, we have portable air conditioners that go into those rooms, and um, there's, there's a good number of them that do. Um, but the feasibility of air conditioning our entire school district um, is, is, is very difficult to do. It's, it's probably not in the picture. Can I add to, that, to uh, add to that? So just to clarify, so last year the board had wanted to be a little bit more proactive with our buildings and grounds work and we, uh, we, we the board, increased um, Dr. Fieser at the time, her recommendation by $300,000 because we wanted to say up front, we'd like to do the first and the second priorities in each school. Um, that amount was reduced by the Board of Finance, and yes, uh, the Board of um, Aldermen subsequently uh, reinstituted $80,000 of that money. So at that point, that $80,000 administration um, had to prioritize what, you know, a little bit went to every school, but um, they had to prioritize what that would be, What because it was only a small percentage of the $300,000. Uh, the Orange Ave work was part of that original $300,000. Now, whether you know, Orange Ave may have gotten some um, air conditioners for the, 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 the problem areas in the school from the, um, the additional money that was left at the end of the year, but the $80,000 was, um, it was not part of that. I don't believe it was part of that amount of money. Um, but I, I do believe they did get some relief at that school. For, there's a couple of areas in the school that are very hot, right? Want to Alderman Vecarelli. Oh. Alderman Fortunati. Thank you. Um, this is uh, to Dr. Kataya, and I'm switching gears a little. Um, with uh, teen suicide now in the second place, uh, leading cause second leading cause of death for ages 13 through 18 in the United States, and depression and anxiety on the rise for kids. Can you tell me what's in place now in terms of mental health education, um, resources, and if there's any plans to amp that up? 
Thank you for the question. Uh, so yes, we have a, a full uh, social emotional learning curriculum that we utilize in our schools. That has been a key focus the last uh, couple of few years. Um, we actually have a supervisor um, who oversees student wellness and ensures that uh, this curriculum and opportunities for students exist in all of our schools. We also um, have very close uh, partnership with um, Milford Prevention Council, uh, and we uh, use everything they could provide us. Um, we bring speakers and, and workshops in for our students uh, through them as well. Um, I know that our school counselors are very engaged with our high schoolers um, and our social workers and school psychologists as well. Um, so, and there are small examples um, that we uh, that occur all throughout the school year. Um, so, a really small example is that there, through a student club, our, our young people are providing um, sort of de-stressing opportunities, activities around exam time. That's happening right now. So I think that our staff have a really close eye and an understanding of the stressors on our young people. I have to tell you, um, our SROs have been really instrumental in this area too. So while um, they were brought in at a time um, in response of safety security, um, I think the great benefit that maybe is quantifiable, um, actually this could be an area, um, our SROs develop relationships with our young people in our schools and I couldn't tell you how many times I get notification that when a child um, is potentially um, challenged in this area of potential suicide, that their first person of outreach is the SRO. Um, that, that, in fact, we can quantify that because we have that, those forms come into our offices whenever an occurrence um, happens. And on it is listed who is the contact. And often it is the SRO that the child reached out to. Um, so that is a win for our school system that our SROs are not just seen as law enforcement, but people who can be trusted. Um, uh, Ms. Swift, Dr. Fedigan, have I missed any pieces here? You've been in the district much longer than I. <laughs> I, I think you've captured what goes on the core very well. Um, I could add that um, our social workers and school sites are very highly trained in supporting students who struggle with any type of emotional difficulties. Um, I should also add, too, that we have a, we have a model COVID team in the district in which So if I could ask a follow-up question, is, um, is mental health education a formal part of the health curriculum? I'm going to say yes. Yes, yes. Confirmed. And, and, it, and in what grades is that? Do you know? If it's just high school or if it extends down to our elementary schools? We know it starts in middle school, okay. formally. Um, I don't know the formalization of it in elementary school. Right.
That another part of great. this equation is to also support parents on how to um, work with their young person today. And so uh, we have a series, a great series of parent university workshops um, uh, provided throughout the year at no cost to parents, um, mostly well attended uh, and identifies um, those at risk behaviors, those issues that our pre adolescent adolescents are dealing with, and how parents can best deal with it as well. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. There's also um, at the high school level, um, we have senior universities and a lot of work done with freshman transitions and even fifth graders going into sixth grade. So, um, and these are some relatively newer initiatives that um, have come into place in the last couple of years that are really, really popular and extremely well attended. Sounds great. Thank you. Alderman Golden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I just want to um, talk a little bit about what Karen was talking about, and that is um, the social, emotional, and the self-contained. You had brought that up. And why is it only at foreign and not at Jonathan Law anymore? I'm sorry. I don't understand the question. Uh, you had a program that's social-emotional disorder, but now they call it self-contained. Oh. And that used to be over at foreign and at law, and now it's only at foreign, and they took it out of law. And so I'm trying to understand why you don't have it at both schools. I can speak to that. So we had, um, we, were, we looked at what, what made the most sense for where programs can be. So we, when I came into the directorship, I was noticing that it, at one school there was a program with three children in it, you know, on this side of town, and then there was a program, same exact um, focus area with 15 students in it, for example, and you, you can't substantiate having the staff for three students. So what we did was we looked at the schools, so we looked at Jonathan Law, we saw all the opportunities that surround Jonathan Law. There's a lot of shops, there's easy access to um, transportation systems. Um, and so the programs we put at Jonathan Law were the, the functional learning programs um, where we want kids to be out in the community getting vocational experience, kind of that kind of um, focus. And then we thought what programs would make sense for foreign. We looked at the layout of foreign and so we moved the um, Success Every Day is the name of the program um, that I believe you're referring to to foreign where the majority of the kids were and where we were able to um, strengthen the programming. So for example, when we, when we took the two separate programs and joined them into one, I was able to add a dedicated school psychologist to that program, which strengthened the program immensely. I was able to add a point four social worker to the program kids alone because I was able to consolidate into one building and that's why we did that. How are the kids then at Jonathan Law being served by that program? So are you busing those kids over to foreign? Yes, yep. if they're able to go there, absolutely. If they meet the entrance criteria and it's determined by the DPT that that's appropriate for them, absolutely. Sure. Alderman Vecarelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to make sure that I had uh, some of my figures here uh, correct. I, um, they're not exact by any means, so don't hold me to the figures, but I just wanted to get an idea that out of our uh, total uh, budget of like 95 million, and the increase of 1.89%, <coughs> is like $1,763. Um, when I, I look at the, um, just the salaries, um, it, it seems like um, we would have an increase of, um, of $900,000. Yes. So, um, you know, our, our um, 1.7 million is 
contractually, we've got to pay very close to one million of that just in the teacher's salaries. So um, that leaves us with a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit uh, like around eight hundred thousand dollars for everything else that we're talking about in the school system. So once we get by the uh, the teacher salaries and uh, and I don't think that's taken into benefits. Uh, no, it's not. That's not taking the benefits into account either, right? No, the three hundred twenty-seven thousand in benefits. Yeah. So then we're we're down to um, like a half a million dollars is really what we're sitting here and talking about. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, you uh, have basically saved through either the six teachers that we no longer have and other cost cutting factors that you have worked in, um, you've saved almost a, a half a million dollars, a little, a little less than a half a million. But you know, what we're talking is um, um, besides our contractual um, with the salaries and benefits, we're at around 500, we're at a half a million dollars and you guys have saved us a half a million dollars. So. Um, you know, when I, when I look at these figures, um, you guys have done a very good job. I mean, the, I know it's still a 1.8% uh, increase, um, but the contractual agreements that we have for our salaries and benefits, if we didn't consider that, um, the, the, the half a million that more that you need and the half a million that you have saved um, is, um, it's pretty good in my book, so I would like to um, I would like to say that you've done a very good job at putting the budget together. I I know there's a few things here in the budget that um, that you've added in that you thought we might need. And last year, um, I, I was very happy with the wish list of things that um, would make life better in the school for the kids and. I would hope that you know a lot of those things uh, that we gave you the money for, like the air conditioner in that one room that was hot, um, made life better for the kids, and you know uh, things went went well. But um, all in all, um, I can you know I I don't see a problem with this budget. I think you guys did a, a very good job putting it together, and we're sitting here talking basically about a half a million dollars, and you saved us a half a million. So. I thank you very much, and uh, that's thank you. it. Thank you. Alderman Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure who directed this. You, you provide a very helpful summary of uh, some of the system improvements and some of the areas of savings, which are always of interest. Um, can somebody maybe expand a little bit? There's a reduction of 120,000 from substitute teachers from last year's um, allocation, uh, despite the fact, as you helpfully note and uh, are included in the notes here, that the per diem for substitutes has gone up during the last school year from 75 to 90 dollars. How, how do you account for the the difference uh, from uh, of 120,000? Thank you, Alderman Smith. Uh, the, as, as Alderman Beatty asked earlier, um, the district has, over the last three years, made a concerted effort to reduce the amount of time that teachers have been pulled out of classrooms during the school day for, for various reasons. That's, that's been a concerted effort of the district over about a three-year period, which has reduced the um, substitute teachers line significantly. Um, we've adjusted that in this year's budget in, in the request um, by about $120,000. Um, but as Dr. Kutaya alluded to, um, administration is gonna take a look at that and see where the balance is. So, so I think we've peaked out on the savings that we can achieve in, in the substitute line. Um, but that's how, that's how it was achieved less teachers being pulled out, which required substitutes to go in. Thank you, Mr. Ricciatelli. If I, if I could just follow up, Mr. Chairman. Also on the um, contracted services, which is, is, is significant, um, account 3306, um, 
This mentions a uh, $45,500 reduction in student data portal. I don't know if you mentioned that before, but I'm, try I'm trying to find it in my school district budget book, and it doesn't list that particular item. I don't know if you've referred to it earlier, but um, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on that. And um, also, there is an increase in contracted services being requested this year. So this is just one line item in the budget has been, has been eliminated or reduced. If you could just maybe explain what that is and where some of the increases in contracted services have shown up. Um, sure. The, the reduction in the um, student data portal, um, we, we had contracted with a company um, which was a significant cost. Um, Dr. Kutaya um, asked the, the IT department in the um, instructional division to take a look at that and see if we could achieve the same things, um, I don't want to say in-house, but with, with some of the... Um, some of the systems that we already had in place, rather than contracting out um, with this particular company to provide that service, um, we were able to achieve that. And so we recognized the $45,000 savings in, in no longer contracting with that one particular company. That's, that's just one item within the 3306 account. Um, as, as you stated, um, we can, in your, in your in your budget books, you'll see it's uh, account 3306 is one lump sum, um, but in that is all of our contracted services, and um, is that which one? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, this in in that in that um, line item are things like um, the um, employee assistance program. Um, our copier service, we lease all of our copiers throughout the entire district. Our printer service is in that uh, line item. The um, things like the, the city's medical advisor, um, we pay a portion of the, of, of the cost of the medical advisor, so that's in contracted services. Um, all kinds of things. Um, contracted, when we have to have contractors for snow removal, um, when, when, it, when a job is um, more than then our plows can handle and we have to call contractors in. That's included in there. The ACE My Interview is in that program. Um, we, we could provide the board with a, um, a listing, if you'd like, of all of the items that are in the 3306 account, but it's anything that the district would um, uh, contract out for. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Alderman Beatty. Yes, that was exactly my, my question, which was next. It's a pittance of money, 18000 for the ACE, my interview, and you say that it's been a, uh, a success by uh, feedback. But it, that's outsourced. That's part of 3306, the contracted services, to 851? Correct. So a list, another box with the list of the contracted, w what the specifics are. That would be helpful, maybe in the executive summary. Yes, we can give you a listing. We yeah. actually could give it to you tonight. If we have any yeah. And then uh, 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 the evaluation, the professional evaluations are separate and not part of that contracted mm -hmm. in. I think I was looking for that thinking of the question about the SRO evaluations. Was that part of, you, you would outsource that and, and have it be part of a contracted service or something. Anyway, thank you. It'd be helpful. Alderman Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> as you people stand up there, sit up there, I don't envy you anymore as far as being what is required today and what you could look forward to in the future. We all talked about, we wonder what education would look like 10 years down the road. It's been 12 years down the road for me and it's gotten more complex. Uh, only God only knows what happens in the next 10 years. But I just have a few things that I've gleaned out of the budget. But first of all, I'd like to say, uh, you know, we always talked about parent involvement, and we always talked about needs assessment, we always talked about what's best for our community. Last night at Foreign, 
uh, MPC, which I'm a part of, um, sponsored a vaping program for parents. In attendance were four parents. So when we look at problems and when we look at problematic issues, you know, we always try to see in, you know, the needs assessment, what we need to talk about in our community. Uh, and so we had four parents there. The other piece that I just want to, uh, to talk about that Superintendent Kataya said that, you know, the district and families were really torn apart during a redistricting and um, reorganization of schools. And that I think happened in 12, 13. And I think parents were disserviced because we went to a K2, 3, 4, uh, 3, 5, then to 6, 8 in the four year program. And we just tore parents. We tore the, pa the family apart, our fault, our bad. Um, so it wasn't more redistricting in my mind that uh, I don't know how long redistricting lasts, but I thought we always talked about an, an average of five to six years. After five or six years, there was a need for for redistricting. I don't know if that's true or not, but I always thought in a certain amount of time, schools can't go on forever because of fluctuation and fluidity in the system, in the, in the city where kids move from one area to the next and all of a sudden uh, it skews the numbers as far as what's going on in the, uh, in the community. So those are the two things that I wanted to bring up other than the uh, congratulations to you guys keeping the budget at 181.89 and I, and I like the idea of uh, chairpersons, Glenn, uh, chairperson of the Board of Education, I, in, in, her, in your preamble indicating the fact that you identified a number of areas of savings and the superintendent or preamble of the board of the um, budget were, were mindful of economic conditions facing the community. So you have the community at heart. Uh, these, these are the kinds of things that are happening. We talk about assessments in every classroom as, a, as an observer or as a supervisor of teachers and principal of a school. You go into a classroom and you look at questioning. And questioning is an important piece of the day in the classroom because a teacher questions a child because she wants to know what that child just got out of that lesson. So we, we do classroom assessments, individual assessments. We had our own school assessments, grade level assessments. We had district assessments. We had, we, we had state assessments. We had all kinds of assessments were going on at one particular point in time. I, I think my claim to fame when we were doing CMTs is that my fourth grade class in one year was 100% of them, 100% of them met goal and above. And so I don't know if that was ever accomplished again with the CMTs, but that was our, our claim to fame at Live Oak School. But I, I did look at the budget very carefully, very carefully, and I just want to bring out some kinds of things. And to my point of assessments, I think we're ready for an assessment. I think we're really ready for an assessment. I think we need a long range plan. I've been looking, looking towards the Board of Education for the last few years, indicating we need a long range plan to know where we're going in five years. Maybe, you know, well, Chairman Vitro brought up the fact that, uh, what about closing a school? You know, that's always a, a, a no, no. Nobody wants to close a school in your district, especially if you're on the Board of Education. But the fact is, but you know, what happens in 10 years? So in gleaning out some of these concerns that I have, uh, according to the budget, I, I will give you a couple, and I don't know if it's they're just out there. If you want to respond to them afterwards, please do. If you don't, that's good also. First of all, school enrollment has been declining over the last few years and will continue to decline in the near future by 100 kids per year. This was also stated in, the, in, the, in one of the letters in the preamble of the, of the uh, budget book. Six out of eight of our elementary schools are under 300 kids and one is 223 kids, according to the October 1 census sent to the state. Average class size in one school in kindergarten is 13 kids. In grade two in another school is 12 kids. The total education budget is 1.8 million more than the city budget. Health benefits, in addition ancillary costs, total 28 plus million dollars for a total education budget of 123 plus million dollars. Per pupil expenditure, according to that, is about 22,000 per child, while the expenditure per city, per citizen on the city side is $2,000. The last district assessment, as I had alluded to before, was in 1213, showing that the proposed budget, this year's budget, 
has increased the cost per billion to, per building to two to three times more expensive to operate. For example, in 1213, Pumpkin Delight School cost the Board of Education $2,832,756. Again, my math may not be there, but I'm cleaning out all the, the numbers. In 1920, the cost will ra ra rose to $4.3 million. Orchard Hill School in 1213 cost the Board of Education to run approximately $2,800,000. In 20, it's costing them to run it $6.1 million. The high schools are at $15 million per school, over one-third of the Board of Education's operating budgets. A middle school that was just renovated, and that's East Shore, I've been serving on the Permanent Schools Committee now for 12 years, more than that, even when I was before that on the board. And um, there were six classrooms, and the school is under 400 students. I think it's underutilized. I don't know that for a fact. So what I'm saying is that we need, we need to put our feet to the grind or to, uh, boots to the road or whatever we do with the Board of Education and come up with an assessment, needs assessment for the next five, 10 years. We need to address this issue. We have a lot of, we have a lot of mindful issues that are according to the, bo board, uh, to the budget, even though we raise only the, the budget only went up 1.8 million, 1.89 percent. The fact is, it's increasing year after year after year after year, and pupil enrollment is going down year after year after year. So these are the kinds of things that I look when I look at that budget. And being an advocate of education, I'm not looking for anything less than better education every year from all of us. And I know we we all had a keep our feet to the grind when we were in those schools with observations and making sure teachers were there and curriculum and driving and driving and driving. And so I, I know that's happening today. It's no fault of anything. But I, I just, in, in those concerns of mine, they're concerns, they're deep concerns of mine, and the fact remains that I think the Board of Education needs to look at that, some of those areas, and give us some answers. Maybe next year, within maybe make it a priority of coming up with an assessment and a five to 10 year, very fluid. We all know that, that when you do long term uh, projects, it, they're always going to be, uh, they're always going to be fluid and, and they're going to be changing year by year, but I think we need a long range plan from the Board of Education. Thank you for your efforts and all the work you do. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the Board of Education? Alderman Tranquilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, what are the contractual agreements, if any, for classroom size in the schools? Can we get that information to you? We don't want to guess, but it, it, it's different. Contractually, it's different by level, so. Thank you, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Only because of what Alderman Vitale was saying, if we can compare it and see in comparison to the, to the schools and how many students are in each classroom, it make it a lot easier to make a determination. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the Education operations. Seeing none, I think that's it. Thank you very much for answering all our questions. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. I'd like to entertain a motion to recess to the next budget meeting on May 1st, 2019. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to, motion, to recess to the next board meeting at May 1st. Yes, May 1st. All in favor? Aye. Opposed?
Bu senin kredi mi?